Welcome, everybody, and good morning. Um, I'm Oksana Mont. I'm Professor in Sustainable Consumption and Production at the uh, International Institute for Industrial Environmental Economics at Lund University in Sweden. Uh, and my goal today is to give you um, a quick um, insight into what the concept of service sizing is. Uh, we can think about service sizing as it has many different faces, but if you look at your everyday life, you will certainly find examples where you either use services or you get in touch with different people who provide services or uh, also service customers. We uh, more and more, uh, instead of using and working just on our laptops, we are working in the cloud, uh, we are saving our documents elsewhere. We in my institute, we are not even uh, using our own laptops. Uh, we have um, um, much simplified uh, computers, which um, allow us to access servers in Stockholm and in Norway. So we never actually work in the local laptops, but we work uh, with the servers and documents that are stored there, provides more security, and we are not dependent on constantly upgrading our hardware. Um, this um, funny picture shows the photocopier. If you uh, perhaps noticed, uh, many of the photocopy um, original uh, manufacturers, they market themselves as document companies because consumers, usually institutional customers, are not paying anymore or not buying the photocopies uh, themselves, but they are paying per each copy they are making. If you are thinking about this example with photocopy, so in, in my institute we are also we are leasing the photocopy machines and we are paying for each uh, page we are copying. What this creates, it creates a very different incentive for us to make sure that we are not overusing uh, the copy machine because of each copy is uh, on the list, uh, is tracked. Um, but also it creates an incentive for the producer of copy machines to make them as um, durable and as robust as possible because what they are paid for is not the machine itself, but how many functional units, how many pages it delivers. Also, for us as customers, it's very uh, useful because if something happens to the copy machines and our products are getting more and more uh, uh, cumbersome and uh, you get a small phone and a 400-page manual uh, with it, so what we are relying on is the services. So if something happens with the copy machine, then uh, the service provider comes and fixes. We, we, we do not need to know how to fix the product. With the cars um, in mobility sector, we also see a lot of people, especially in cities, uh, and especially with young generation, they are relying or they do not want to own a car because of, again, a lot of uh, trouble associated with it, uh, servicing and paying taxes and also problem with f uh, finding parking space. So a lot of people opt out of uh, car ownership and instead uh, joining car sharing, peer-to-peer um, -peer or commercially provided car sharing clubs. Uh, so, in, in this pre-project, a lot of attention was given to defining actually the, what service sizing is. There's been a research done on different variations of service sizing, but we came forward to this um, definition that it is a transaction where value is provided through combination of products and services and where satisfaction of customer needs is achieved by selling function of the product rather than the product per se. So instead of buying car, you are buying access to the car and possibility to uh, fulfill your mobility needs without the, actually the need of owning the, the material good itself or by increasing the service component of the offer. So any, any combination of products and services, it has different uh, a degree of uh, products and services input. And this is also important. And why function is important? As I said, for us as consumers, it becomes less and less important to actually own stuff. Although our entire society is built on the, we, on, on the notion of ownership. If you come to a bank, they do not uh, ask you how good person you are, if, if, we can, if you are a reliant, um, reliable client, if you can lend you money. They ask you, do you have any capital assets so that uh, you, we can use it as a collateral. Uh, in the new economy, the sharing economy that is increasing um, and emerging in Europe and across the world, we see alternative systems of 
trust are developing where not mon money and uh, capital assets become your collateral, but actually how trustworthy you are as a person. Um, what is also interesting or important to notice is that uh, when we look in terms of, um, think in terms of life cycle of a product, from raw material extraction uh, to production uh, to use phase and to disposal, we can see that service sizing can take place in all life cycle stages. It can take place in production, in the use phase, in the waste management, or in the um, end of the life cycle stage. For example, in uh, when we think about um, production, there we see and find quite a lot of examples of service sizing, which happens between companies. In Sweden, uh, car manufacturer Volvo, they are not buying, they used to buy chemicals or paints to paint their cars themselves. Now they don't do it, they outsource this, or they buy services of Castrol, who uh, provides the service of painting cars for them. Volvo is not um, expert in, in paints and how to paint cars. They're expert in design and metalworking. Castrol, on the other hand, is expert in, in chemicals and paints, and they know exactly how to provide function, a car painted, uh, and reduce uh, the input, the material input that leads to environmental uh, impacts, that is the paint. Um, so in, in traditional way, if you think about uh, the traditional relation, uh, Castrol wants to increase the volumes of paint they sell. And uh, Volvo as consumer, as customer, they want to reduce the volume and of course they reduce the price. In the service sizing arrangement, when Volvo pays Castrol per car painted, their incentives are actually aligned because both uh, customers or both uh, companies, they want to reduce uh, the cost of the material good uh, so that the margin for Castrol is increasing. Um, so this is a very important distinction and also it, it has the possibility to then reduce the environmental impacts of servicizing system because it reduces the material input of the system. So if we try to look uh, further at uh, and compare conventional sales and functional arrangements. With conventional sales, what is sold is product. Uh, with functional arrangements, we are selling function. Uh, with conventional, it's, there is always purchase on approval. We, we, you come to a shop, you often cannot test the product. You see how it looks like, but you cannot really try whether it actually fulfills your needs. Coffee machine, I could never try the coffee that machine is uh, providing. Uh, I can check if it, the color fits my kitchen or if I like the design, but not the actual function I want from the coffee machine. Uh, with functional arrangements, uh, you purchase while testing. You can test and you are subscribing. You can arrange a different time for contract for testing the product so you can change uh, while you are testing. There is always fixed warranty and we all know that producers, uh, by testing their products, they know exactly when the product uh, will get uh, bad, uh, go bad and it usually happens the next day the warranty expires. In functional arrangements, we are avoiding this problem because the function is guaranteed. As I said, we uh, wrote the contract with a photocopier provider, and they are there to deliver service. Uh, with conventional sales, at the point of sale, ownership is transferred to consumers, which means for policymakers, they can target and develop policies for the relatively few producers, but they, it's very difficult for them to target millions of consumers with very diverse behaviors. On the other hand, with functional arrangements, the ownership for the product, for the material good, is actually retained by the producer or provider, which means that there is, they, are still in, in the, um, they still take charge of the product and they also know that the products are coming back to them. Again, this creates the incentive for them to design durable products and to make sure that they are working uh, long and can be used intensively and thereby we can reduce the, the environmental impact. Also, uh, it's always a constant utility. Once you bought a two-seater car, you cannot use it when you have three kids. Uh, if you subscribe, on the other hand, to a car-sharing club, uh, your function, you can adjust the function according to your needs. So it's tailored offers and you can customize what services you are getting. Um, also, uh, for many people, especially now in the time of still going on ongoing uh, financial crisis, investments, original investments, 
um, are significant. If you buy a car, that is a big uh, deal for, for many of us. Uh, with function arrangements, you do not need to pay the uh, initial investment. You are paying per uh, monthly costs, so your costs are spread. And as I said, from environmental perspective, what we see is that in traditional way uh, selling of products, it's a linear material flow. Uh, and the speed and the volume are increasing um, as we speak. While in functional arrangement, there is a potential to close the material um, flows. So key elements of a service sizing system, uh, we talk about, of course, products and services. We talk about consumers as they are the ones who um, buy the offers. And there's been a shift. I've been studying this um, um, phenomena in 15 years now, and I think in late 90s, people were really skeptical of buying services and sharing stuff with others. But I see now there has been a shift. Also, with um, uh, the state, the material goods as status symbols is also increasing, uh, decreasing, while the uh, the sort of willingness to be connected and have broad network that becomes a social symbol. So this is all important. Uh, also, business models, as I said, companies are there to uh, make money. Uh, our goal is to make sure that they are making money in a much more um, resource efficient and environmentally sound way. Innovation, of course, helps. The systems, they are not, um, they also require some, um, uh, some changes in the product design, but also we need to think about how we design services so that they ensure uh, reduced environmental impact. And here, of course, ICT, information and communication technologies, are a huge enabler. We see how the development in the ICT um, uh, products really spurred uh, the uh, dissemination of services and service sizing models. And of course, infrastructure, there is always infrastructure involved. So again, thinking about each service sizing solution um, separately, we need to look at the big infrastructure and make sure that it actually enables the systems. Um, so if we look at the uh, business models, uh, for example, there, is, there are many ways of how to provide mobility. Um, by the way, do you know what, what is the main function of a car? What is the main function of a car? Mobility. That is mobility. Are there any other functions of car the cars are fulfilling in society? Status. status. It is a very much status symbol. So again, what does it mean? It, it has implications for how business models are designed, what kind of services we as consumers are getting. For people who do not care about uh, social status, they are fine with car sharing where normal cars are shared. For people who want status, they want shared cars, which do not first tell to everybody that they are shared, and they have something cool. They might be very fancy cars, which person uh, themselves cannot afford, but they can sort of get access to it and go on a hot date with a Ferrari. And next day take a thin car and, and go to work. Um, so for some people, there are bicycles that are providing function, that's enough um, and that's sufficient. For others, um, they want again Rolls Royce and access to the lifetime service. Uh, also, for some people, mobility means actually non-mobility. I think I'm getting more and more into this uh, stage and, and thinking, why can't we have all the conferences online? And, and we're also working with travel-free meetings. How, what is the purpose of us meeting here? Of course, it's very hard to substitute mingling around coffee, but in principle, we are here to meet and to learn about something new, which is, uh, can be easily done online. So the telepresence, the last point here, that's another business model which is also part of the mobility. Um, infrastructure. We can think about different types of infrastructure. Um, that's a big hardware in society which is hard to change. But there are also other types of systems, infrastructure systems and institutions like financial system, which need to be adjusted um, to provide uh, space for service solutions. ICT, as I said, um, 
is a big game changer in a way. Uh, here, just a few examples of uh, how ICT is used in mobility, in car sharing clubs or in services. And you can, we can see that ICT is used for fleet management, for connectivity, for battery charge management when uh, it's car sharing for electric vehicles. They use it for location services, for payment, for booking, for car maintenance, and uh, for even uh, tracking the um, key performance indicators, like, for example, in Michelin fleet, they have their uh, tires by mile, so they know exactly in which stage, in which, um, how far the tire have been worn out. And, of course, for route planning. So examples of service sizing, we find them not only, of course, in our daily life, in uh, through car sharing or by sharing the washing machines in our households or in laundromats. When we borrow uh, do-it-yourself tools, you do not need to have your own drill if you want to put some um, paintings on the walls once in a while, but you can actually borrow it. Or by the service, when we go skiing, you do not need to have or own your own skis. You can. Uh, borrow them there and get them adjusted on the spot. Um, in also between businesses, there are a lot of in different sectors, and in some sectors it is a very high penetration rate in uh, um, electricity management. We we see more and more that companies that are selling electricity, their margins are very low, so they want to sell uh, more services. And so it's in in sometimes it's very funny because one department of electricity provider are getting their Christmas models and for selling a lot of electricity, while another department is selling megawatts, teaching the customers how to reduce their um, energy demand. And we find them with chemical management services where companies like Volvo outsource uh, their chemical needs. Um, we find them in integrated pest management and agriculture, which you will uh, hear a lot. Uh, afterwards, carpet leasing programs, again, instead of selling carpets, they're selling flooring solutions, cleaning the floors um, and upgrading the carpets to extend their product life. Document companies, furniture services, a lot has to do with flexible working, uh, working um, type that we are doing now. So some uh, one day there might be 60 people in the office which want to work in groups on projects. Next day there could be only 20. So furniture um, service providers, they are offering space solutions and so on. So what is the added value of service sizing? First, of course, it's diversification of market competition. Uh, we are offered customized and localized solutions. We are all different consumers, and we all also have, especially in Europe, very different cultures. Uh, so it's important that solutions are provided locally, and that is the nature of services. They are close to the end consumer. They can be customized and tailor-made. Also very important for Europe, as we heard, I mean, nowadays production is happening elsewhere. So what we as... Um, producers or as consumers in Europe can deliver and, and get as value. So it is chance for the old, our European economies to compete with producing economies, add value through services to products that are produced elsewhere. And of course, generation of less resource intensive GDP. Just one example from Philips. They are companies that, the company that used to develop lamps. If we look at their website, what are they selling now? They are not selling lamps anymore because lamps are produced in China. So what are they selling? They are selling the ambicines, they are selling smart bar, they are selling um, different light sculptures, they are sen selling uh, metronomies, uh, a light uh, dependent on the weather, so the street lamps uh, light and, and turned off and on depending on the weather conditions, sound light comfort. So all these are additional services. They're not selling uh, hardware anymore. From the consumer point of view, what do we get? We had, of course, uh, uh, higher quality professional services, low risks with, for example, chemical management that is paramount to reduce the risks also, high diversity of material and non-material offers. Uh, before, we were innovating on the product, product side, so we were quite restricted. Now we have the whole diversity of services uh, offered. We also get economic savings with uh, not needing to invest up front, but uh, could spread our costs throughout the uh, use of the product. 
In terms of social impact, what we see is that for many people, again, in this uh, sort of strenuous times of financial crisis, we see that access to products and services is important. So we're reducing the differences between people and the society by offering them access to products and not necessarily forcing them to buy them. So it's, it is about affordability. It is enabled through possibility of pay-per-use um, business idea. Also, job creation. Not as I said, services are localized. You need to know um, to have intermediary between the producer and the consumer, and there we can employ local services who know the uh, consumers. And um, also, when we think about the need for the photocopy machine, we need uh, someone to upgrade to maintain our products. So again. Yet, we, we still don't have the remanufacturing uh, facilities in place, so there is a lot of handwork uh, involved in actually maintaining and upgrading our products. So there is opportunity for job creation, and I said um, higher local uh, cohesion. And also, um, if we think about well-being and welfare, I mean, instead of somebody said that our lifestyles are now is about managing the material stuff we have at home. So basically, the stuff that you have, it owns you, and you need, we are spending more and more time on cleaning, maintaining, taking to the repairs, and so on, filling up, buying cartridges, filling the car, and so on. So all this time, think about it, we can free if someone else can uh, provide these services for us, and we can focus on actually uh, having free time and having fun. So in terms of environment, um, what can we say? The idea is that to create highest possible value for the uh, consumers and use the least possible uh, amount of material resources. Here we have idea about car sharing where we see the last column, the ratio, how many cars are shared by how many people. So in Asia, uh, 26 people share one car. In Israel, there at the end, we have uh, the highest ratio, 72 people uh, share one car. And the idea is, as I said, that until point of sale, it's the producer responsibility in the traditional way, and then it's the consumers who are using products, and if they know how to dispose of them, that's fine. But with servicizing, then it's the producer or provider who is responsible for the product, which means that we end up with various sort of organized backflow of resources and materials. And when we are thinking about eco-innovation, uh, in terms of products, we can improve only product, but if we think in terms of services, then we can improve the product, we can improve the service, we can improve the, all the um, uh, do, um, input materials, like here in the case of washing machine, we can improve the washing machine itself, we can improve on detergent, or get rid of it altogether, or, and we can improve the um, maintenance service. So in terms of environment, what we see is that we can reduce um, environmental impact and substitute for less harmful um, inputs, for example, chemicals, castrol knows which are the least hazardous, so they can do that. Um, and there is a potential for absolute decoupling, but uh, it's not automatic. So there we need policy input, uh, which can ensure that servicizing systems are actually leading to uh, decreased environmental impact and not to increased um, <coughs> consumption-related impacts. Thank you.